Hey, this is Robert, and I'm at the station getting ready to go on the air, and I got a pretty good show uh, lined up for tonight. And I'm going to be talking to Dr. Michael Kinch. He's a vice chancellor with Washington University in St. Louis, and he's also the author of this book, Between Hope and Fear, A History of Vaccines and Human Immunity. So we'll be talking a lot of medical history tonight. So I hope you enjoy the show. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Do you enjo enjoy science and medicine? Yeah, you probably do if you're listening. You enjoy history. Well, I do, so this is why we're doing this today. <laughs> and if so, I have the book for you. And on today's show, I have the author of this really informative, enjoyable read. It's called Between Hope and Fear, A History of Vaccines and Human Immunity. Uh, the author's name is Michael Kinch, Ph.D. Uh, Dr. Kinch is a vice chancellor at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he has experience developing new medicines for Ebola, Marburg, flu, and other emerging pathogens. Dr. Kinch, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. It's great to be here. Okay, well, love the book, and I always get hooked uh, when they have this combination of uh, medicine and history. So, Dr. Kinch, why this topic? Uh, what, did you have a motivation or a goal, or is it just a general interest? Well, my work at Washington University has been cataloging and identifying the sources of innovation for all medicines that have ever been used in people. And um, a logical extension of that was to look into vaccines. And the fascinating thing about vaccines, and, and as a step back, my training is as an immunologist. So I've sort of spent most of my life uh, combating foreign pathogens or cancer. And um, what I was surprised about is how much misinformation is out there about vaccines, or even the credible information is sometimes confused. And so it was kind of a fun process to go through and find out what was the history of, first of all, how we got vaccines in the first place, and then what vaccines have been developed and who were the individuals involved in doing so. Yeah. And is this your first book or have you done others? I've actually, this is my second book. Um, a third book actually just came out, believe it or not. It's sort of an extension of this one, but it's focused more around cancer. And it talks about um, not just cancer itself, but some of the new immune therapies and some of the vaccines for cancer, such as the, the HPV vaccine for human papillomavirus and the HBV vaccine for hepatitis B, which is for liver cancer. Sure. Now, you start out the book going back millennia uh, with a history of smallpox and particularly the Antonin Plague. Um, Dr. Kinch, what was the Antonin Plague and what was the effects on the Roman Empire of that time? So there have been a couple of cases um, and, and probably many more that we aren't even aware of because before recorded history where civilization was pretty much either stopped in its tracks or in some cases the whole human species was threatened. And one of these occurred uh, during the Roman Empire when the um, basically a disease that got started in and around the area that today Baghdad um, took over the, the Roman Empire, and it worked its way from the troops on the front back to uh, Rome itself and caused an enormous amount of both human suffering and instability to the uh, Roman Empire itself. And it's known as the Antonine Plague. And what's amazing is that this wasn't the only time that the Romans would suffer this. Um, there was what's known as the Plague of Justinian that occurred around 500 A.D. that almost ended Western civilization, at least organized Western civilization. And uh, for the, it looked like for a while that the Roman Empire might be coming back um, in the 500s, and pretty much the, the Justinian Plague put an end to that. Now, this wasn't the first time smallpox devastated or was even noted in human history. Uh, maybe it's not in writing, but we do see it in um, 
Egyptian mummies and stuff like that, right? Yes, you can find actually from, well, the earliest writings that we have are from ancient Egypt, and they mention it's a medical text, and it mentions smallpox. And we know from some of the mummies that they have characteristic smallpox scars. And smallpox is historically probably killed more humans than any other pathogen that's out there. It's, it's incredibly dangerous, in part because it spreads very, very easily. And our species has been combating this for thousands of years. Now, with the Antonine Plague, do we really know it was smallpox? I've, I've read elsewhere that people say it might have been measles, but which, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so there is um, quite a bit of evidence pushing and advocating for multiple different um, pathogens that cause this. Some folks think there was a smallpox component. Other things that think that it could be the plague, uh, Yersinia pestis, which is a bacterium rather than a virus. Um, others think that it could be other pathogens. And the reality is that oftentimes when one plague gets started, it renders the population susceptible to others. So it's quite conceivable that everyone is right and that it was a combination of different infections that altogether uh, were very, very crushing. Yeah. Um, Edward Jenner, right? Uh, some in the audience may recognize his name, very famous for the discovery of the smallpox vaccine. However, you know, there's some people that argue that Jenner is not the inventor. What's the backstory behind this? So I went into the book um, under the assumption that Edward Jenner had developed the smallpox vaccine. And in doing my research, it turns out that he did not. He was clearly the first to popularize it. But um, it's pretty amazing. To put some historical perspective, Jenner, um, basically the story goes that in about 1796, he realized that milkmaids had clear skin. They didn't have these smallpox scars that most of the population had from those who had been exposed to smallpox. And he realized that milkmaids didn't have this. And that the reason for this is the way the story goes, is that he deduced that the um, milkmaids had contracted a, a different disease, sort of a mini smallpox, if you will, called cowpox. They got it exclusively on their hands and lower arms. And it turns out that this infection protected them from the smallpox, which would infect the entire body and was often lethal. Cowpox is rarely, if ever, lethal. Um, and so the idea is that he started to intentionally infect people with cowpox uh, with the idea of, of future protection from the smallpox. Well, in looking at the research, it turns out the story is mostly correct, but it's attributed to the wrong person. Um, 20-some years before Jenner, there was a farmer from Yetminster, England, uh, which is about 50 miles from where Jenner lived, um, by the name of Benjamin Jesty. And Jesty was actually the one who put two and two together. He was not a physician, whereas Jenner was. He was a dairy farmer. And he had heard these stories from milkmaids about, you know, gosh, isn't it interesting that we don't ever get smallpox? And there was a smallpox outbreak occurring in the city that he lived in. And he intentionally walked miles and miles. It turns out none of his herd had any cowpox. So he walked from farm to farm with his family until he found another family that, or until he found a farm that had cowpox. And then he in, intentionally infected his family, and they all survived a subsequent smallpox outbreak. So it's, it's basically not Jenner, it's Jesty. So is this just a case of who got the patent first, or <laughs> is that how it works? I think it, so. what it came down to was that Jenner popularized it. There, and I go into it in detail in the book, but Jenner probably heard about this from two or three different sources uh, when he was training to become a doctor. And he put two and two together. He may have independently thought of it, but just the, actually when um, the smallpox vaccine was introduced by Jenner and it became very popular, he was given thousands of Pound sterling um, in gifts and rewards and, and had all these accolades. And a few people said, hey, wait a minute, it, it wasn't him. There's this guy named Jesse that did it 23 years ago. And um, in going through the records, actually, the British government concluded, yes, it was Jesse, but they'd already pretty much invested all of their uh, the reputation into Jenner. Right. And so Jesse got a little prize. 
but um, it, but Jenner definitely made it more popular, and and whereas yet whereas uh, Jesty didn't tell many people, and the reason he didn't do so was because he was being ostracized for having done this, and we can return to that because it was really one of the early signs of the anti-vaccine movement. Um, but Jesty was very quiet about it, uh, whereas Jenner made a lot of uh, publicity from his findings. Now, we'll go ahead and talk about that. Why was he getting ostracized? So, again, going back um, 17, I think it was 74, um, Benjamin Jesty intentionally infected his family with cowpox. Now, it turns out, and he did, Jesty himself had been variolated, and variolation is the idea of infecting a person with smallpox, but doing so while they're healthy and, and, and doing it under the skin rather than breathing it in, which is the normal way that, that smallpox is, uh, is contracted. And um, this variolation would work to protect people, but it would kill somewhere in the range of about one out of five people that were variolated. So it was incredibly toxic. So Jesty was looking for an alternative, and Jesty himself had been variolated, but his wife and children had not. So he went through, he intentionally infected his wife and children with this cowpox, and it turns out that the wife developed an infection. And the reason she did so is because Jesse used his wife's dirty knitting needles, and he ended up introducing some bacterial infection under her skin when, when he infected them. And she went to the local doctor. Well, the doctor found out about this, and this was clearly years before, centuries before HIPAA, because he told everyone that would listen what Jesse had done. And there were a lot of fears uh, that because Jesse had, had used cowpox and introduced cow material into his wife and his children, that they would suddenly sprout horns and become these terrifying minotaur-like creatures and go through the village. <laughs> So the family was excluded. Jesty, every time he would go into town, various organic materials were thrown at him. We'll keep it clean. Uh -huh. um, and he was eventually run out of town. And that was part of the reason why he stayed silent um, for many years. Oh, that's a fascinating story. That's a book in itself right there. Um, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, Dr. Kitch, I, one of the, my favorite parts of the book were when you kind of focused in on some of the I guess my heroes, these different titans of microbiology and, and, and their work and, and the stories behind them. And I'd like to ask you about a few of them. And, uh, and, uh, first one would be Robert Cope and clearly his influence lasts to this day, right? I mean, he was, he was, Absolutely. he was just, like I said, a titan. Absolutely. There were two major titans that were, Basically, studying infectious diseases. Uh, one was Robert Koch, who was in Germany, um, or in, in the German states, and the other was Louis Pasteur, who was in France. And sort of in the same way that the nations of France and, and Germany were not particularly friendly at the time, the, the two scientists were not particularly friendly. And Koch um, came up with with the realization, and this is keep in mind that. Just around this time, and this is the late 1800s, um, the idea that there were infectious agents that could infect people and cause disease was just really becoming accepted. And um, in the case of both of these men, Pasteur and Koch, they were trying to identify the what we now know to be viruses and bacteria, but they didn't really know them as such. They were trying to identify the agents that were responsible for different diseases anthrax, um, you name it. There were actually many, many diseases. And it was interesting because in Koch's case, he would take a pathogen. Once he realized something would cause disease, um, he would then kill that pathogen. He would use various chemicals and make sure that the pathogen was dead. And then he would inject people with it with the idea that exposure to the killed particles be it a virus particle or bacteria, would cause the um, uh, an immune system to become activated and would subsequently protect you from that disease. Pasteur took a very different approach. He said, let's take an infectious organism and introduce it into species other than people. So you take a bacterium or a virus that is lethal to people, 
and you infect intentionally mice and other animals that will cause that infectious particle to sort of lose its desire to go after people and it's going because it's going after and attacking other species. And that would cause what we now know to be attenuation, which is to make the bacterium or virus weaker. Um, and in this case, it's not necessarily weak so much as it's not human targeted. And then Pasteur would use that as a vaccine to protect people. And in the same way that the French and the Germans didn't care for each other's forms of government and language, um, they, the two different procedures were adopted in, in the respective countries. So the French followed Pasteur and the Germans followed Koch. And uh, it, it's, it's pretty amazing um, it, how the, the two countries evolved differently. Thankfully, the United States didn't really have a, uh, a, a horse in the race, if you will, and we adopted both approaches. Yeah. Well, Coke has a, a lot of accomplishments, as you know. Uh, can you narrow it down? Is there a greatest accomplishment? Boy, I think it, it would be hard. What's amazing about both those two individuals is that they each made um, just amazing contributions. I, I would say that if you look at Pasteur, I think probably pasteurization um, is acknowledged to be what he, his greatest contribution is. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Coke, I think it would probably come down to not so much the vaccines and the antibodies that he developed. And we can talk a whole other thing about Robert Koch and how he, he was the first to, to realize that you could take animal products. You could, you could for example, um, infect intentionally a horse with um, diphtheria. And then you could collect the blood and, and collect certain proteins in the blood that we now know to be what, what are called antibodies, or at the time it was known as gamma globulin. And you could use that gamma globulin to protect people. So the horse got the infection. Um, the horse, by the way, was fine. The, uh, diphtheria doesn't kill horses. And those gamma globulin molecules could then be used to treat or, or prevent the disease, either or, either to treat or prevent in humans. And that would probably be one of Koch's major contributions. But he also, as did Pasteur, ended up, Koch ended up um, identifying and discovering many new pathogens that we didn't know about before. So it was an amazing time, and, and these folks did many, many things. Yeah. Well, I'm talking to the author of Between Hope and Fear, A History of Vaccines and Human Immunity, and the author is Dr. Michael Kinch. And um, Dr. Kinch, Koch had ties to Paul Ehrlich, too, who is another one with uh, uh, quite a resume. Um, who is Paul Ehrlich? Paul Ehrlich, I think, is one of the most interesting scientists who, who's ever lived. And I would argue that his contributions are, they either uh, are comparable to or potentially exceed even Einstein. Um, Ehrlich was initially trained um, in Germany. He grew up in Germany. And Germany at the time, and this is now the late 1800s, early 1900s, Germany's big um, super industry, if you will, was in making dyes. And Ehrlich grew up in an area and actually had, a, I think it was a brother-in-law and a cousin that were in the dye industry, where you would dye fabrics and things like this. And the chemicals that were coming out of these dye factories um, Ehrlich and others began to realize, boy, you can actually kill um, pathogens using some of these dyes. And Ehrlich developed, for example, a drug called Salversan that was the first pre-antibiotic, but it was basically an antibiotic. It, it was not an antibiotic in the conventional sense that we use today, but it was the first agent that was purposely used to kill bacteria. Um, Ehrlich went on to uh, do an extraordinary amount of work in, in beyond just his drugs in being able, again, to identify new organisms and to develop vaccines against them as well. So Ehrlich was absolutely, um, when you look at all that he accomplished, and it was not just in the, the fields. Early on, he, he was primarily in the field of um, developing new antibacterials and antivirals. But later on, he went to revolutionize cancer therapy. And uh, late in his career, he basically ended up being um, one of the key drivers of the immune oncology revolution today. And, and that's what my new book is about. And Ehrlich is prominent in that. 
And it's basically the, the idea of training the immune system or retraining the immune system to be able to target cancer. So Ehrlich, you can argue, I think very strongly, developed some of the first antibiotics, some of the most innovative vaccines, and then went on to develop what are today's new cancer cures. Hmm. So and a truly extraordinary life. And, and you mentioned uh, Salverson, and that was a treatment for syphilis, am I right? That's correct. Yeah. It was a, a, a dye, a metallic compound that uh, had the ability to um, kill syphilis. And we've you know, long since sort of forgotten about syphilis. But when you look through the historical records, the disease was incredibly prominent. And one of the insidious things about it is that it would progressively cause the brain to degenerate and people would go insane. Um, eventually from having syphilis. And so today we look back and think, my gosh, you know, Salversan's a pretty toxic molecule by, by today's comparisons. Um, but for the time, people were more than happy to, um, you know, run their risks because syphilis was invariably fatal and would lead to madness beforehand. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you, you really kind of answered my question already. I was, I was going to ask, why would Salversan not be used anymore is antibiotics just that effective and or because of the toxicity and and you really uh did answer that already um let, let me let me swing back to pasture real quick and you mentioned pasteurization um and i think you kind of hinted toward what i'm going to ask you it's i i I'd like you to talk about the story of his work with uh, charles chamberlain and anthrax i, I found that really fascinating Yes. So um, Pasteur went back and he was interested in a, it, 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 keep in mind that Pasteur at the time was trying to identify what are the causes of various diseases. And so he had two major um, contributions to science and humanity in, in roughly the same time period. On one hand, he started to identify new pathogens. On the other hand, he started to weaken these pathogens. And again, you, you would cycle it through non-human species and then put it into a person. And this pathogen is now not as toxic to people, but it confers immunity that can be used against the pathogen that might be toxic to people. Um, he worked with, with um, a number of different investigators, including Chamberlain, um, in both identifying these organisms and developing the vaccines. One of the most interesting things is that these two investigators working together developed a filter, and this filter was able to strain out, basically, the bacteria in a particular sample. So if you had, let's say, a contaminated fluid that you knew could cause disease, this filter could be used to strain away all of everything except for the bacteria that were causing it. What was amazing was that using these filters, it turns out there were some things that would leak through the filter and yet still had the ability to cause disease. And by definition, it wasn't a bacteria. And that turned out to be the earliest evidence of what we now today know to be viruses. And the reason why these viruses leak through the filter is they're so incredibly small that the little pores that make up most filters were much larger than the virus itself so they could slide straight through it. Um, wasn't there something about anthrax, though? So, um, yes. So they developed the very first um, effective vaccine was an anthrax vaccine that the two of them developed. And um, they basically went on to, there, there's a story, and this was one of the things that was surprising. We think of Pasteur on a pedestal as doing nothing wrong. Um, it turns out that he had... Um, weakened the virus and showed that it could be used to be an anthrax vaccine. But the results and the way in which he did it turned out to not be accurate. And he knowingly um, misportrayed how they had done the research because he was so busy advocating his idea of, of weakening these pathogens. And what they ended up doing, the, the, the story is, that Pasteur had advocated this idea yeah, yeah, Dr. Of, Dr. Kinch, can you hold yeah. that thought? I'm up against a hard break. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. No, not a problem. And uh, hopefully you can stick around for the second half. And I'm talking to Dr. Michael Kinch, and I will see you after the break. Well, welcome back to the program. 
Well, I'm joined today by the author of the book, Between Hope and Fear, A History of Vaccines and Human Immunity, Dr. Michael Kinch. Dr. Kinch, can you go ahead and uh, continue your discussion on the uh, Pasteur Charles Chamberlain anthrax story? Yes, um, I'll just sort of briefly tell it, and that is that Pasteur and, and Chamberlain were both ready to go on vacation. And in Europe, as you're probably well aware, they oftentimes take two or three or four weeks. And that's a tradition that goes back to that time as well. And what happened was that Pasteur left town and he left instructions with this Charles Chamberlain, the the man that worked for him, one of the scientists who worked for him, and said, hey, inject these chickens with this particular bacteria. I think that, that it'll be deadly. And it was an anthrax bacteria. Chamberlain forgot to do it. And he went on vacation as well. He got back before his boss, and in a bit of a panic, he injected uh, the chickens with this vial of bacteria that by this time was now many weeks old. And instead of dying, the chickens that he injected survived. And not only did they survive, but, you know, and and they were both surprised because by this time, Pasteur came back and was like, hey, did did the chickens die? And Chamberlain said no. And then they went with, they, they... got some anthrax that was particularly deadly, and they immunized the same chickens, or they treated, I should say, the the same chickens and fully expected that the chickens would now die. They didn't. And Pasteur realized at that point, hey, the first exposure to these bacteria that had been sitting around in a tube and it clearly died off, that protected the, the chickens for the rest of their lives from any further exposure to anthrax. Now, anthrax, part of the reason why these experiments were being done is that anthrax was absolutely decimating the chickens, the sheep, many other um, food animal uh, species throughout Europe. And suddenly, Pasteur realized he had a vaccine that could protect these animals from anthrax. And very quickly, that idea of killing the bacteria or weakening them was the idea that Pasteur favored it and moved forward. That's amazing. Love that story. Well, what we've been talking about is a bunch of people essentially out of Europe. So, so while we have all this great science uh, happening in Europe, it did eventually start up in the U.S., right? It did. We really became involved um, in the 1930s, 40s, and then starting in the 50s, the United States really started to dominate um, the production and the manufacturing of innovative and new vaccines. Yeah. And one uh, individual I found, I never heard of before, I found the story really interesting, was Pearl Kendrick. Dr. Kinch, who was Pearl Kendrick? So Pearl Kendrick worked in uh, Michigan for the health services, and she ended up uh, working on... uh, and I'm pulling a blank all of a sudden on the pathogen she was working on. Pertussis? Um, but she, pertussis, thank you. Mm. Um, and she ended up uh, realizing that there was an opportunity to take a weakened strain or a, a weakened strain of uh, pertussis and using this as a vaccine. And up until this time, and it turns out that Pearl Kendrick, along with two of her coworkers, um, all three of whom were women, and this is in the 1940s and, and early 50s, and at a time when women were rarely scientists. Um, they ended up, these three women up working for the state of Michigan Public Health Service, ended up developing the pertussis vaccine that would be effectively or essentially with one modification is the same one that's used today. And um, I think it's estimated they've saved three or 400,000 lives per year um, with this discovery that they've made. Well, the anti-vaccine movement, uh, a massive problem today, but it's essentially as old as vaccines itself. Dr. Kinch, where and when did this all start? Well, you can actually argue that the anti-vaccine movement is older than vaccines themselves. Oh, okay. Which... Sounds like a ridiculous statement, but I can actually defend it. And the reason for that is that you may remember we talked earlier about the use of variolation. And variolation is the idea of taking smallpox and purposely infecting an individual and thereby um, giving them hopefully a sublethal 
um, uh, infection that doesn't cause death with the idea that when now they're exposed to smallpox in the real world, that they'll be protected from it. Now, it was toxic. Um, maybe one out of five people were killed by it. And so there was a very strong anti-variolation movement. And this anti-variolation movement was already very strong and in place around by the time that Jenner popularized the smallpox vaccine using cowpox. So many people who were naturally resistant to variolation sort of transferred that to cowpox-based vaccines. And um, it required, it ended up requiring in the United Kingdom um, compulsory vaccination for, with the cowpox to prevent smallpox. But anytime the gov- a government anywhere uh, compels someone to do something, there's always going to be a population that is very unhappy with it. And so um, it turns out that every vaccine that's been introduced has always had some movement that's been opposed to it. For the most part, when you look back at these, the anti-vaccine movements, it really comes down to people who are afraid of something that they don't understand. Um, either it's something that's new, or when you're talking about microorganisms, which by definition are microscopic, they're so small you can't see them, a lot of folks don't necessarily appreciate the lethality um, that many of these germs have, many of these bacteria and viruses can have. And so there has been a strong, and unfortunately it remains a very strong, misguided. It's not that these are bad people, they just don't necessarily know all of the information. And unfortunately, um, these movements are natural. Most of them dissipate as more knowledge about something comes out. But every now and then you'll get bad rumors. And unfortunately, we're in a period of time where there are bad rumors. Um, and that's specifically at the moment around the measles, mumps, and rubella, what's known as the MMR vaccine. Um, and But it turns out that's just the most recent variation of these bad rumors that have gotten around. Yeah, we're going to touch on those bad rumors momentarily. But I want to talk about this other uh, interesting character in your book, uh, Gordon Stewart. Never heard of him either. A very interesting player in medical history. He seems like he was doing some pretty good work. and then. Things went south. Yes. So he is one of these characters who is a scientist who, um, it was early on, he was a physician. And later he became sort of a a skeptic and a crank. Um, And there's really no other way of putting it. I I try to, to not offend people and come at it objectively, but Stewart, as one example, um, was an early advocate that HIV was not the cause of AIDS. And he, in particular, his ideas gained um, credibility, is probably the wrong word, they they gained interest in many African nations who were convinced that HIV was either not a real thing or was something that was concocted by the West, by by the United States and Europe, in order to um, suppress Africa. And um, Stewart gave them a lot of credibility or a lot of um, newspaper space and was on TV and, and became a very popular figure, particularly, uh, particularly among some of the more repressive African governments. Well, that idea of always being kind of counterfactual um, against the facts also applied to vaccines. And this goes back now to the 1970s and 80s. And he advocated the idea that the diphtheria pertussis and tetanus, the DPT vaccine, was causing a disease that we would today refer to as autism. But at the time, it was referred to as neurological damage. And um, he very strongly, again, he had a, uh, because he was a very colorful figure, unfortunately, many people followed him. And the consequence of this was that in the United Kingdom in particular, he advocated for uh, that the DPT vaccine should be discontinued. And um, we can talk about it if you're interested, but there was a major trial that occurred, which actually captured the entire nation and and, and one can argue the world's attention around these false claims that the DPT vaccine caused uh, neurological damage. And ultimately, it was proven inaccurate. It was proven to be basically um, the imagination of this individual, um, as well as others who, who advocated the idea. 
Well, interesting. It sounds like a precursor to the Andrew Wakefield situation. Well, the amazing thing about this, and this was probably my biggest shock in writing the book, was that there was a young um, uh, reporter by the name of Brian Deere who was absolutely convinced that the DPT vaccine was causing these neurolog- this neurological damage. And he was just out of college. Um, he lived in a commune and uh, was a very strong leftist. And he was convinced that this was the government covering up the DPT vaccine, causing all of this damage. So he decided to do an expose about this. And Brian Deere ended up investigating and interviewing the parents of these kids with DPT. And he realized almost immediately that they were lying. And the parents were lying or misrepresenting what had happened to their children. And all the children had had neurological damage. And the parents were trying to, to say that the vaccine caused it rather than either random chance or, you know, bad luck. And they were doing so because they were going to get money from attorneys um, from suing the government. Uh, and this was, again, in the U.K. And so he went from being a vaccine skeptic to realizing, hey, the skeptics that he thought he was sharing views with were actually themselves doing this purely for profit. Now, the amazing thing about this is that this same Brian Deere, two decades later, ends up being the person that exposed Andrew Wakefield's fraud. Mm-hmm. And he didn't, he didn't spend his entire career doing vaccines. He's an investigative reporter. But he realized when this, the MMR idea came around that MMR was causing autism, he said, gosh, this sounds a lot like the DPT situation. And he started looking into it further, and he realized that Wakefield had intentionally, first of all, biased his study. So the idea was that Wakefield was setting out, and he was motivated purely and totally by greed. He was setting out to show that the MMR vaccine was bad. So he designed a study that was intended to show this, and he biased it. We can go into the details if you're interested, but he, he biased it incredibly so that he would get the desired outcome. It turns out when he ran the numbers, he didn't get the outcome. So instead, he just completely fabricated the findings and to, to create the outcome that he wanted. So he, he fudged the data, as we say in, in science. Um, and he published this in a journal, very high-profile medical journal called The Lancet. And this idea that the MMR vaccine was associated with autism found its birth in completely fabricated data from an individual that was motivated by greed. Well, it's unfortunately, we're, we're still living with the damages. Mm-hmm. Wakefield was, his paper was, they tried to reproduce it, they being the scientific community, no one could reproduce it. Eventually, largely as a result of Brian Deere's investigation, it was shown that Wakefield had faked the results. Nonetheless, Wakefield has continued to write books, make movies. He gives speeches, apparently, for large amounts of money um, to people that want to hear his ideas. And the consequence of that is that we've had growing skepticism about the MMR vaccine, and we're now living with in a world where measles, mumps, and rubella, especially measles, are coming back. Yeah, yeah. He, he can certainly be considered the father of the current anti-vaccine movement, in my opinion. Um, yeah, and, and you first really saw it in, in Europe, in England, right? And it, it didn't hit the U.S. till a little bit after that, right? Yeah, so Europe is about five to ten years ahead of us on most of the anti-vaccine movement activities. Um, the extreme example right now in Europe is in Eastern Europe, where uh, the Ukraine is, is counting not thousands of measles cases, but hundreds of thousands of measles cases. Um, Because of vaccine skepticism in Poland, uh, Ukraine, parts of Germany, uh, they're now looking at measles uh, at a level that it used to exist before vaccines. Uh, I had a Ukrainian uh, journalist contact me uh, when the book first came out, and she indicated that in Kiev, the, the capital, the vaccination rates are approximately 19%. 
one nine percent, and in the countryside, it's almost zero, and it's almost entirely dominated by this anti-vaccine idea. And the consequence of this is that measles is running rampant. Um, in order to protect the population against measles, um, at least 19 out of 20, and it's probably considerably higher than that, of the population needs to be previously immunized. It's something called herd immunity. Um, and when you are at levels of immunization of 19% or single digit percent, um, obviously you, you've lost your protection against that virus. Yeah. Now, uh, concerning herd immunity, um, can you explain to the audience, audience exactly what that means? And from my understanding in your book, you say that the, that the anti-vaccine movement uses this as justification for their movement. Yes. So the idea of herd immunity is very simple. Um, what is the likelihood, and, and statisticians figure this out, um, epidemiologists can figure this out, um, what is the likelihood that one individual will contact an infected individual and thereby acquire the infection? Now, if you, and you can think of this as a, as a herd of cows. If it turns out you're in a big field and some percentage, let's say, let's say that 9 out of 10 cows have to be protected to keep the 10th cow that's not protected safe, then that would be a herd immunity of 90%. What that really means is the likelihood that we're being infected, the likelihood that an infected cow is going to bump into that cow is 1 out of 10. So that means 9 out of 10 at least of those cows have to be protected. Um, it turns out, and many people will, and so the way the anti-vaccine movement has basically exploited this is to say, hey, look, these vaccines are terrible, which they're not, but they'll make, if they are advocating that these vaccines are terrible, they'll say all of your neighbors should get protected and that'll, and your child then doesn't need to, and all of your neighbors will keep your child from becoming exposed to it. The problem with this is that when you look at something like measles, which is very easily transmitted, and Lord forbid should smallpox ever come back, which is very, very easily transmitted, it turns out that you have to have the vast, vast majority of the population to be protected in order to keep your unimmunized child safe. The Unfortunately, herd immunity, again, for measles is generally accepted to be 95%, meaning 95% of the population at least needs to be um, vaccinated and, and protected in order for an unvaccinated person to be safe. If you look at many states, uh, my home state of Ohio, I believe, is down to 80 percent. Um, many states are down to the, into the 80s, 90s, um, some in the 70s percent of the population is safe, which basically means if you do not have an, a, a vaccinated child, that child is most likely going to get infected. Now, measles, to put in perspective, causes a, can cause a horrendous um, central nervous system damage that far eclipses autism. So while there is absolutely no link between the MMR vaccine and autism, ironically, these patients, these, these anti-vaxxers are increasing the likelihood that their children are going to develop a severe CNS, central nervous system disease. Um, let me, uh, I guess you can't talk about vaccines without discussing Maurice Hilleman. Um, I got about five minutes left, Dr. Kinch. Um, who's Maurice Hilleman, and can you talk about the Gerald Lynn strain? So um, Maurice Hilleman is, I believe, the human being that's credited with the most different vaccines. So we mentioned earlier how the United States was a bit late in joining the race, but um, Hilleman, and particularly Hilleman when he was working at Merck, uh, pharmaceuticals or Merck Laboratories, Hilleman developed an extraordinary number of different vaccines um, for a number of different childhood diseases as well as some adult diseases. The Probably one of the most famous examples of this was when his daughter, whose name was Geraldine, uh, became infected with a, a childhood disease. Um, she ended up, <clears throat> excuse me, she ended up um, becoming sick. Her father comes home from work, and um, he realizes that the strain of 
uh, the organism that she's got, and I'm having to remember what the, uh, I believe it was measles. Um, I think it was that, mumps. Mumps, thank you. Yep. Sheesh. Um, so, uh, I, just, I just read the book. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I was, I, we were mentioning earlier, I, I wrote the book a year and a half ago, so right. I'm pulling these wounds out of the loop. So Geraldine had mumps. And Hilleman, who was a workaholic, sort of a consummate workaholic, comes home at night. His daughter's got an infection. He gets a sample of the uh, material that she was breathing out and rushes back to the laboratory and ends up from this sample. And again, her name was Geraldine. Um, he ends up developing a mumps vaccine that is the same mumps vaccine that it protects millions of, and actually arguably billions of people um, on the planet today. Um, and so Geraldine actually is still around. Um, she is very low key, um, but she is, I believe, a patent attorney uh, on the West Coast. And her contributions, whether they were consciously done or not, um, are extraordinary. And it was, and the mumps vaccine was just one example of what Maurice Hillam and her father um, really contributed to society. And I believe he's considered the one, the one human being that has saved the more lo- saved more human lives than anyone else, other than I believe the people who developed uh, fertilizer. Wow! So there are actually websites that count how many people someone has saved, and Hilleman is in the hundreds of millions. That's incredible. Um, got about uh, about two minutes left. What was your favorite chapter? Uh, I think as we we went on, it was uh, the stories about, I'm sort of struck by Brian Deere, and I ended up interacting with Brian. Um, He is, again, a reporter in London, and in the course of doing so, he shared with me some of the findings, or some of the findings, some of the emails that he receives from anti-vaccine movement people, Um, and the vitriol, the, uh, I, I really won't repeat any of the uh, the really graphic words and descriptions of what people are going to do to him. The fact that he persisted not only in exposing the DPT vaccine fraud, but then ended up in a, basically the same place, different time, and exposing the MMR vaccine fraud is extraordinary. Um, he has himself saved an extraordinary number of people as a journalist, not as a scientist. Um, and so I think that part of the book and writing that was really a revelation. Yeah. And, and there's, and there's current, um, scientists today that are great advocates for vaccines that are going through the same thing. Uh, different guests I've had on the show in the past, Paul Offit and, and Peter Hotez, and they, they are getting bashed left and right <laughs> from this movement. And uh, absolutely. And, and, and these are people that have dedicated their lives to helping others. And unfortunately, they, they have to deal with this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, again, the book is titled Between Hope and Fear, A History of Vaccines and Human Immunity. And I'll link to it on the show notes page when I publish the podcast for the show. And I want to thank you, Dr. Michael Kinch, for joining me today and sharing these stories with the audience from this really, really good book. Thank you, Robert. I've enjoyed it a lot. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 